put an emoji in the chat, something that shows that you're excited for day two, because we're going to kick this thing off. We're going to hit the ground, ground running. Our very first speaker is Dr. Alan Williams. Alan Williams has a tr tremendous understanding from the scientific and from the practical side of regenerative agriculture. He can go super deep on the science, but he, he also brings that down to the level that you need so that you can understand it to make the changes in your business. And that's really what I like about him is it's, you know, he walks the talk. He's a farmer, a rancher, direct to consumer business. He knows what it takes to run a business. He knows what it takes to build soil on the ground, not just from a textbook and from theory. He knows the needs of animals. Um, and I can't think of anybody better to tie the pieces together of building a profitable regenerative business than Dr. Alan Williams. So Alan, we're, we're honored to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Jared. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, looking forward to sharing with everyone this morning, and I'm going to leave some time for Q&A and all of that as well. So uh, I'll just dive right in. I'm going to do a share screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Looks great. Standing. Oh, it's working. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so again, I'm Alan Williams. Just very briefly, uh, I, I, I'm six generations. So the question that was asked uh, earlier as we got started, how many generations? I'm, I'm six generation uh, and very much value that heritage. That has a lot to do with why I do the things that I do today, to be quite honest with you, uh, because I want to be able to continue that heritage and 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 I want to see many, many other families be able to continue that heritage and, and continue to bring their kids and grandkids back to the farm. I'm very, very happy to say that uh, you know my my son uh, operates our Mississippi farm now. He's the general manager there, and I actually have a grandson that also is uh, working for us on the farm. So I've got two additional generations, you know that are that are in the mix here. Uh, so I'm um, also, as Jared said, I'm a former university researcher and professor, so I have that experience as well. And But I am a, a regenerative farmer and rancher, and I'll share with you some of the things that we do as we go through the course of my presentation today. Uh, but we are rather diverse in terms of the, the species and the di different enterprises that we, that we implement on our farms. Um, in addition to that, uh, my partner, Gabe Brown, and I founded uh, three different companies. Uh, we founded Understanding Ag, the Soil Health Academy, and then about four years ago, our most recent launch was a company called Regenified that is a regenerative verification and aggregation company. Uh, with an understanding ag, we are the consulting arm and we consult uh, throughout the U.S. and 45 plus other countries around the world over across six continents. Uh, we have consulting staff now, full-time consulting staff in the U.S., Canada, New Mexico, the U.K., and Ireland. And uh, we've worked in all 50 U.S. states as well as, like I said, many other countries around the world. In the U.S., we're currently working across more than 35 million acres in what we're doing and more than 50 million acres globally. So we've worked across every conceivable environment that you can imagine. And the things that I'm going to share with you today work irrespective of your climate, your environment, your agricultural enterprises, your soil type. None of that matters, guys. None of it matters. The principles are the same. They are universal. The only thing we have to understand is how to apply those principles within your individual context. That's what's critical here. Uh, so you have to have a definition for regenerative agriculture. That's what we focus on and what we do. And this is our definition. We call it farming and ranching in synchrony with nature to repair, rebuild, revitalize, and restore ecosystem function. And here's the key part of the definition, starting with life within the soil and then expanding to life above. Now, 
Over the last eight plus decades of agriculture, we have spent an enormous amount of time focusing on what is above the soil surface, what we can visually see. And to be frank with you, we have spent precious little time really thinking about the life within the soil. And in many different aspects of agriculture today, we almost act like there's no life in the soil. Soil is just this sterile medium that holds roots of a plant. And it's all dependent on the chemistry that we apply over top of that soil. And what we have learned is that is not true at all. We've acted over the last eight decades as if chemistry drives everything. But what we have really found is that biology drives chemistry. And if I have chemistry problems in my soil that we often call fertility, we can resolve those pretty readily and pretty quickly by focusing on resolving the biology problems in the soil. And then the biology resolves the chemistry problems. I love this quote. I use it every time I speak and every time I do a one-on-one -on -one consultation with somebody on their farm or their ranch. And this quote is very true. It's by W.C. Loudermilk. And it goes like this. The land does not lie. It bears a record of what we write on it, a record that is easy to read by those who understand the simple language of the land. And that is a truer statement could not be made. Every time we go on a farm or ranch anywhere in the world, the owner of that land can never lie to us. The operator of that land can never lie to us. Just by making a handful of simple observations, we know immediately what has happened on that land, and not just for the last handful of years, but for decades. And especially when we stick a shovel in the ground. So for those of you that know us, we never go anywhere without a shovel. You know, we're always digging in the soil. And, uh, and every time you stick a shovel in the ground, that speaks volumes. It's like you're digging up an entire library of books that are a history of that land. So make no mistake about it, our management is written on the tapestry of the land. And for us, this is what it's all about. It's about how do we create, foster, facilitate more and more life on our farms, on our ranches. This is what we're always going to be core focused on each and every day. And it's also about this. How do we restore a fully functioning carbon cycle? And, you know, in today's world, too many people are taught that carbon is this evil thing that we've got to suck out of the atmosphere and suck away into the soil to never be heard from again. And that's just simply not true. What we really need to be doing is returning this earth to a fully functioning carbon cycle where carbon's coming in, going back out, coming in, going back out. And make no mistake about it, relative to the de definition I just gave you, what we have clearly found is that as we implement the rules and the principles that, I, that I'm going to share with you here in just a moment, we begin to see life exploding on our farms, on our ranches, again, starting with life within the soil and expanding to life above. So if we talk about a grazing operation, as we move along the continuum from continuous grazing to adaptive grazing, we see life exploding and expanding. The same thing in farming operations. As we move along that continuum from very con conventional to regenerative, life explodes. And the same thing if we're talking about orchards, vineyards, gardening, whatever the case may be. It applies to, again, every type of agricultural and agronomic enterprise. So over the past three plus decades, Gabe Brown and I have been implementing regenerative principles and practices on our own farms and operations, which, by the way, when Gabe and I started, the term regenerative was not being used. And honestly, neither of us knew what to call it. We didn't know, even know each other at that point in time. All we knew was we had to do something really differently because the conventional simply was not working and it was not profitable. So today we have boiled it down to what we call the six, three, four. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly share these with you today, and then I'm going to give you some real life examples of what happens when you diligently and intentionally apply the principles and the rules to improve the ecosystem processes. And to learn a lot more about this, I'll invite you to go to our website at understandingag.com. And we have a lot of information and explanation about the 634 there. But it starts with this, the six principles of soil health. Principle number one is know your context. This is so important. Real life agriculture, real life ranching cannot be prescriptive. The very moment we make it prescriptive, we have started the, down the road of stagnation and frustration. So there's no such thing as sustainability and stasis in real life, guys. For instance, not a one of us here today stays the same age. If we continue to live, we get a year older every single year, and there's nothing we can do to stop that. So we can't sustain ourselves. And we're biology. How in the world do we think we're going to sustain something out here on our farms and our ranches or create stasis? We, we cannot do that. So we have to understand that in regenerative agriculture and adaptive grazing are never, ever prescriptive. And that's a litmus test. If you hear somebody talking about regenerative or adaptive, but they're handing you a prescription, a formula or a recipe, they're not giving you something that's regenerative or adaptive because it can never be prescriptive or formulaic. We have to follow principles instead. So number one, know your context. Without knowing your context, you cannot appropriately and profitably and successfully apply the other five principles. You must define your context first. So very quickly, the other five are Minimize disturbance, and this means minimizing tillage, minimizing chemical and synthetic applications, and even manure applications. If we're applying stored manures, we can over-apply stored manures. Minimize overgrazing, returning too soon with our grazing, those types of things. All of those things can be disturbances that harm our soil life and our productivity. Number three, keep the soil armored or covered. In the work that we do all over the U.S. and globally, I can tell you this we're failing miserably in number three, absolutely miserably. When we look globally, and especially here in the U.S., the vast majority of our soil is adequately covered less than a third of the year. And that just doesn't work, guys. It doesn't work at all, and it's creating unfortunately, serious degradation of our soils, our ecosystems, and even our climate. Number four is diversity. Mix it up. And, and I'm not talking about just diversity in terms of our crop rotations and our cover crop species mixes, but also on our rangeland and our perennial pastures. Diversity in our enterprises all of that matters. Diversity in beneficial insects, diversity in bird species and wildlife. Number five, the living roots in the soil year round. And number six, reintegrating animals back into our systems. You know, another thing that was mentioned this morning, I think David Stennett mentioned it, but it, you know, about this deal with, uh, you know, the fake meats and all of this. The fact of the matter is we do not need less livestock on our landscapes globally. We need more because managed properly, they are incredibly powerful at building soils, at building ecosystems, and building a favorable climate. So that's the six. Now we dive into the three, and the three are the three rules of adaptive stewardship. And these are rules that, again, we... we determined with an understanding ag based on 30 plus years of observation and just doing this. The first rule is the rule of compounding. And what this means is there never are any singular effects. Everything we do on our farms or on our ranches creates a whole series of compounding cascading effects. And these effects are never neutral. 
they're either positive or negative. And oh, by the way, the rule of compounding applies in our personal lives as well. For those of us that are married and have families, if we say the wrong thing to our spouse or the wrong thing to our kids or they say the wrong thing to us, it's never it never produces a singular effect. It produces a series of compounding cascading effects in our relationships. So this rule applies throughout all of life. Rule number two is the rule of diversity. Diversity was a principle. It's also a rule. It has the same meaning. Rule number three is a rule of disruption. And this is the rule where we prevent ourselves from becoming prescriptive or formulaic in what we do. We can implement planned, purposeful disruptions to be able to make ongoing progress and never reach a point of stagnation. The one thing that I've become absolutely convinced of, and in my study of scripture as well, I have found that this is backed up in scripture, is that there are no limitations on this earth, guys. There's no limitations with biology. There's no limitations with abundance and diversity. And it, it, it clearly states that in Genesis. And, and I think we have forgotten that as farmers and ranchers, and we have self-imposed thresholds and limitations and ceilings on ourselves. And I'm now completely convinced that they don't exist and that we can continue to build as long as we're stewarding this creation like we need to. So I'll illustrate the rule of disruption like this. If you think about a human athlete, nobody becomes world class. Nobody competes for championships. Nobody competes in the Olympics by doing the same exercise routine at the same duration and intensity year after year. They have to introduce planned purposeful disruptions in their exercise routine to be able to continue to make ongoing progress, to challenge their bodies, to challenge their minds. Well, if that works for us and we're biology, well, why do we think it doesn't work out here on our farms and our ranches? It absolutely does. So nature has incredible resilience. And if we introduce planned purposeful disruptions, we can just almost unfathomably continue to increase the resilience out here on our farms and ranches. So that's the rule of disruption. Again, you can go to our website to learn a lot more about very specific disruptions that you can implement that'll help you. And the six principles and the three rules we implement very specifically to optimize the four ecosystem processes. These are the four things that always have been and always will be free to us. Unless somehow, Jared, our government figures out how to tax us on this, okay? I don't know. But uh, but right now, they're still free to us. So uh, energy flow, sunlight. We need to capture as much sunlight as we possibly can because this is the source of energy here on this earth. So and, and every plant out there has leaves that are nature's solar panel. So we need to be capturing as much sunlight as possible. That's broken right now. We have many different agricultural enterprises that are not doing a very good job of capturing sunlight. The second thing that's very broken globally is the water cycle. The third thing is the nutrient or mineral cycle. And the fourth, here we go again, diversity. So diversity is a principle, it's a rule, and it's one of the ecosystem processes. So might not diversity be just a tad bit important to us? And oh, by the way, I think that when we take a look at creation as described in Genesis chapters one and two, I think we see a picture of unbelievable diversity that was put here on this earth to begin with. So that's the six, three, four, very briefly. Now what I want to do is share with you what can happen in just a couple of regenerative trials. What can happen when we are intentional about applying the principles and the rules to what we do on our farms and our ranches. So in this first trial, what I did was we took more than 120 of the different farms and ranches that we're working with, and we're working with thousands of them, but we, we took more than 120 for this data set, and all of these were here in the U.S., 
and we looked at their first four years of progress. So year one was a year that they made the determination to transition into regenerative principles and practices and start implementing the 634. And year four was, you know, the data from that is what happened after the four-year time period. Now, this four-year time period is critically important because we are finding this to be crucial in terms of what happens in this regenerative timeline. And it's also highly predictive. We can, if you're intentional about this, we can be very predictive in what's going to happen on your farm and your ranch in the first four years. So the pictures you're looking at right now are pictures of the shovel test from a handful of farms and ranches that were taken at the beginning of year one. Okay, when they first started these principles and practices. And none of these soil divots that you see here represent a healthy soil. So I'm hoping nobody thinks that these pictures here are of healthy soil because they're not. These are sick soils that you're seeing in these pictures. How can I tell? Well, they have crusting on the soil surface. They don't have porous soil surfaces that can immediately begin to infiltrate a rainfall. They are heavily plated and compacted soils. They have little to no aggregation. And you'll notice even in some of them, as you go down deeper into the soil profile, the color gets lighter and lighter. So these are not healthy soils. But what happens by year four? Well, we begin to see soils that are like this, that are deeply and heavily aggregated, no crusting on the soil surface, very uniform color from top to bottom, and deep roots. And here are some additional examples of this. We, we see this aggregation driving deeper and deeper into that soil profile, and the roots obviously are driving deeper into that profile as well. And so let me share with you what we found in our analysis. So when year, by the end of year one, many of these farms had built a soil aggregate depth a little greater than two inches. By year two, we, were, we had a soil aggregate depth deeper than four inches. By year three, deeper than six. Now that's pretty good linear progress, okay? And I'll take that. Uh, because we're increasing aggregate depth year over year. But look what happened on average by year four across all these farms and ranches. They had gone from a little more than six to almost 15 inches in soil aggregate depth. Now, guys, that's incredibly profound okay, to, to be able to do that. And here's the deal. That's exponential. You know, we went from linear to hockey stick on the graph. And the reason for that is in years one, two, and three, you're building sufficient microbial biomass and population profile in the soil. And what we have discovered is once you get to a certain point with that microbial biomass, particularly with building mycorrhizal fungi population in the soil, then it changes from being linear to exponential. Your progress explodes once you build enough biology. So building biology is absolutely critical to achieving this. And so if we look at, again, what can happen, we find that, um, that we have a mean increase in total fungi across all of these farms and ranches for the four-year time period of 176%. Mycorrhizal population increased 153%. The saprophytic fungi increased 199%. And in the pastures that were in this study, in the rangeland, the plant species diversity on these perennial pastures and rangeland increased 123%. Now, it's important to note that not on a single one of these farms or ranches was any seed purchased and planted in these pastures or on the rangeland. So that 123% increase 
and plant species diversity came solely from the existing seed bank that was already there in the soil. So we didn't have to spend a penny on seed. Okay? So that was critically important. And what allowed it to respond was, if you remember the picture I just showed earlier, that very deep aggregation occurring, allowing that seed bank to begin to express itself. And then here's some other benefits that we found we saw significantly enhanced water infiltration and retention. Now, I don't know how many of you are in drought right now. We are. Um, we're in a rather significant drought here in Mississippi where I'm at. Um, but as I, I look just a few days ago at the U.S. Drought Monitor, and it's been expanding quite significantly yet again, you know, from west to east. And so ability to be able to infiltrate and retain water has never been more important than it is right now for us here in North America. The other thing that we saw was we had far greater forage biomass production, more plant species, insect and bird species diversity, better animal health and performance, better nutrient cycling in the soil, and greater resilience. And again, with the climate challenges that we're having, uh, this resilience aspect is crucially important. So to further back this up in the progress that can be made, this is one of our clients, the Snowcrest Ranch out in southwestern Montana. And they're a rather large ranch, but they have this this was year five. So I was out there in, in August on the ranch doing my annual consulting visit. And this was their fifth year. And by year four, they had experienced that exponential progress that I talked about going from years one to four. But even with that, I was still shocked at what we saw in year five. So we not only did shovel tests, but we went out and we took a backhoe and we dug soil pits on many areas on the ranch. And what we discovered was rather staggering. So they initially dug these soil pits down to about three feet in depth. And, and I went into this one pit that's pictured here, and I saw immediately soil aggregation down to that three feet depth and roots in, in high abundance down to that three feet depth. And I said, hmm, this continues to go further than this. So I took my shovel and started digging a little deeper and kept finding aggregation in roots. And then I said, get the backhoe, let's dig some more. And, and we kept digging and kept digging, getting it down to seven feet or so in depth. And we found that the aggregate depth went down to seven feet and roots were going deeper than that. And so as we measured different parameters, water infiltration was absolutely off the charts. Plant species diversity, in those fields had just exploded, and the morphology of the plants had significantly improved as well. And we also saw far better plant phytonutrient content and plant bricks content. So all of those things were noted when we were there doing that. Now, this is one of our clients' farms in upstate New York, they were not in that data set that I just analyzed, but I, but I got their data just a few months after I analyzed that data set. And I said, wow, look at this. It follows that exact same four-year trend. And so again, they're in upstate New York, and, and I just want to share some critical numbers here. Their soil pH in four years went from 5.7 to 6.9 with no lime or anything else purchased and applied. This is solely biologically mediated improvement in soil pH. Their organic matter was already pretty good at 7.3, but in four years it increased to 8.9. We, we saw significant improvement in total living microbial biomass, in total fungi, mycorrhizal and saprophytic fungi, and their protozoa population tripled. So again, they followed that exact same four-year timeline that I just described. So we're seeing this globally. This four-year timeline is very, very predictive. So then I want to share another study that we did. 
And this was in collaboration. We had a team of more than 25 scientists that were participating in this. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Lundgren and his team were some of the scientists that were participating in this study. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Richard Teague, Dr. Jason Roundtree, uh, I could name many, many others, you know, that were participatory in this. And there's already been a dozen peer-reviewed articles coming out that, and there's many more in the pipeline that'll be coming out on this research. So here's what we did. We did paired comparisons between neighboring farms, and the vast majority of these were immediate and immediate next door neighbors in multiple southeastern states. This study is being repeated in the Midwest and the Upper Great Plains region right now. And we, this team of 25 plus scientists went in each year and measured a whole host of things. And I'm gonna share with you just a handful of some of the most important data points this morning. So one of the things that we did was we went in and we installed these eddy covariance flux towers on both the, uh, the conventional farms and the neighboring regenerative farm. And these eddy covariance flux towers measure greenhouse gas fluxes 24-7-365, like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. They also are a complete weather station and they measure soil temperature and soil moisture 24-7. So this was a critical point of, of being able to gather data that we needed to. And here's what we found in that regard, that the regenerative farms were a four times more powerful greenhouse gas sink compared to the conventional. Now that's pretty staggering. And these are immediate next door neighbors, okay? four times more powerful greenhouse gas sink. Secondly, we found that the regenerative farms had three times more grassland birds than their neighbors. And again, the only thing dividing them was a fence. And birds can go wherever they want. A fence is not going to stop a bird. So why were there three times more grassland birds on the regenerative farms and ranches versus the conventional? Well, the birds know where the habitat and the food is, guys. You know, so they're where all of that was. And from this slide, you can see that the bird counts, and these were grassland bird species, okay? They did other birds as well, but this is specifically the grassland. They found an average of 442 birds in nine species on the regenerative compared to an average of 152 birds in six species on the conventional farms. We also discovered that the regenerative farms had 33% more insect species diversity. And Jared mentioned, you know, Dr. Jonathan Lundgren's work where he has found that for every pest, there are 1,700 beneficials. Well, you know, if we can greatly increase the presence of those beneficials, then we no longer have to have a reliance on insecticides and things like that to control the pest. We also found that the regenerative farms had on average 25% more soil microbial species diversity. And when we look at what we call effective rainfall, the ability to be able to infiltrate water when it rains or infiltrate snow melt in the spring or infiltrate irrigation, that the regenerative farms were able to infiltrate 2.3 times more rainfall per acre per hour compared to the conventional farms. Now, we've done hundreds of thousands of water infiltration tests all over North America. And what I'll report to you, and this is with sadness that I'm going to report this, is that the vast majority of our soils now whether it's on ranches, on rangeland, or in cropland, the vast majority of our soils have less than a half inch an hour water infiltration rate. Now that's pathetic, guys. We want to know why the drought keeps spreading, and we want to know why when it rains, we flood 
a lot more quickly now. That's exactly why. Our soils literally cannot hold the water anymore. So this is critically important to be able to infiltrate. And what this equates to is two more inches per acre of rainfall infiltration is another 54,000 gallons of water per acre stored in our soil. So think about how this impacts flood events and drought events. It impacts both of those equally well and very positively if we can store more water in the soil. So I am happy to report that at the end of this trial, uh, this data was presented to all of the families involved, the neighbors, and it was presented to them together. So we sat down on their front porches, okay, and presented this data to them. And as a result of these trials, 80% of the conventional farms that were represented in this study have now transitioned to regenerative. Now that's powerful, just simply as a result of the data that they were presented at the end of the trial. And the two most important data points that convinced them to make that transition may surprise you. One was birds. They had an incredibly hard time believing that their next door neighbor could have more birds than them. That some of them even shed tears over that. It was so profound to them that their neighbor had more birds. How could that be? And the second most important factor that influenced them was this, the water, the water. You mean when I get an inch of rain and my neighbor gets an inch of rain, it's not the same? We're not both getting an inch? Yeah, that's correct. You're not both, both getting an inch. Your regenerative neighbor is getting an inch. They're able to infiltrate that inch. You're getting two to three tenths of an inch. That's all your soils can infiltrate. And the rest is ponding and pooling and running off or evaporating. That, you should have seen the looks on faces when they realized that. That they couldn't infiltrate water. So... It wasn't the profitability, guys. Yes, that was important, and we measured that. It wasn't how much forage they grew. Yes, that was important. We measured that. It wasn't a whole host of other things that we could talk about. It was ability to infiltrate water and the amount of birds that they had that had the biggest impact on these guys. So what that tells me is that they, they really do care about their stewardship, and it upset them when they discovered that maybe they weren't being as good as stewards as they could be. So the third thing I want to share with you, and this all ties in, and then I'll open it up for Q&A, is this. Ultimately, guys, we're in the business of producing food. Okay, We're in agriculture. We feed people. We feed people. Unfortunately, too often we forget that and we think we're just producing a commodity and that's it. We're producing food. It's our responsibility to keep people healthy. It's our responsibility as farmers and ranchers to produce foods that are highly nutritious, that are phytonutrient dense. It's nobody else's responsibility, guys. That falls squarely on our shoulders and ours only. So I take this incredibly seriously in terms of what am I doing in that regard for the foods coming off of my farms? You know, how well am I putting, packing in nutrients and phytonutrients into the foods that our customers are consuming? So in today's world, if you look at the back of a package of any food product or a beverage, you see this panel that's called a nutrition facts panel, right? All of you have seen those. Well, there's a big time problem with that nutrition facts panel. I actually call it the nutrition fiction panel, okay? 
That's that's what it really is. Because you can look at any kind of junk food, and yes, even including the fake meats, and you can look at that nutrition panel, and it can appear like it's a nutritious product when it's actually pure junk. That's because the only thing they're accounting for on that nutrition facts panel are the macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs. And guys, proteins, fats, and carbs don't even come close to defining the nutrition that we need to be healthy. And oh, by the way, neither do they for our livestock to be healthy. So, and I'm saying this as a scientist that used to be heavily engaged in, you know, designing rations, TMR rations and all of this. That's all we concentrated on there. And that was wrong. That was wrong. Because just like that can't tell us a healthy food for us, that cannot tell us a healthy food for our livestock, guys. Okay? You've got to include the phytonutrients. So we've got to include not just the macros, but also the micros, but also the most important aspect of nutrients, the phytonutrients. Now, these are made up of nutritional compounds that all have big words that you can get lost in, like phenolics and terpenes and alkaloids and carotenoids, tocopherols, all of that. But the bottom line is these phytonutrients. Pay attention to two words in this slide. Phytonutrients are powerful antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. Every disease, disorder, and malady known to mankind starts with inflammation. And oh, by the way, in our livestock as well, every problem they have starts with inflammation and then builds from there. So if we can consume phytonutrients, a lot larger profile of phytonutrients in our diets and, in, and provided in the diets of our livestock, they're getting a lot more antioxidants and a lot, to, a lot more anti-inflammatories, and so are we, and we're all going to be far healthier and perform a lot better. So we're doing this research in collaboration with Dr. Stefan Van Vliet. Uh, Dr. Fred Provenza's work of the last 40 years is hugely informative in this, uh, but I can tell you this is the most comprehensive nutritional research ever, ever done. The vast majority of nutritional research starts and ends with the end product, and that's it. And maybe they add in some human clinical trials, maybe. This starts literally with the soil. So Dr. Van Vliet and his team are out there on farms and ranches collecting soil and analyzing it, collecting the plants that our animals are eating. And we're observing what they're eating and then collecting the exact plants they're eating in the portions of those plants they're eating and analyzing that, then collecting their fresh manure and analyzing that, and then analyzing the end product, the beef, the eggs, the poultry, the pork, whatever, and finally doing, doing human clinical trials. No other nutritional research has ever gone to this length and depth and breadth to fit, fully characterize what's really going on. And so, as you see in this slide, an example is we're analyzing the TMR rations for the conventionally fed livestock and comparing it to the rations that the animals and the pastures are eating, whether it's our beef, our dairy, our pastured pigs, pastured lambs, pastured poultry, whatever. So we're observing and collecting exactly what they're eating and analyzing that. This slide's a very busy slide. I'm not going to go through it but it just shows the level of detail of the analysis that's happening here. And this is called metabolomic analysis. So another real big word, but it just simply means that, you know, we're parsing apart thousands of different nutritional spectra in the foods going far deeper than we've ever gone before. So let me share with you some critical data points here that we have found. And these are incredibly profound. And what we have found is that as consumers are finding out about this, this is making a radical difference in their food purchase decisions. So first, if you look at total phytochemicals and antioxidants in pastures versus TMR rations, 
you'll see on the TMR rations, that's over on the far right-hand side, the bottom of the graph, there's basically none, guys. When we're feeding these commodity-based TMRs, there's no phytochemicals or antioxidants in them to speak of. So what do we expect to be in the end product? So that that's a clue to what you're getting ready to see. They just barely show up on the graph, on the bar graph, okay? Now, are there differences on different farms that are doing pasture-raised and, pa and grass-fed and all that? Well, yes, and you can see from the green, blue, and red bars that, yes, there's differences among different farms. And, but yet, every single one of them, in spite of the differences, are still far, far, far better than the animals finished on the TMR rations, okay? And you look at the green bar. So what we've discovered in this research is that there are two critical factors to building phytonutrient richness in the foods that we eat, particularly the animal proteins that we're eating. One is the biological diversity and biomass population in the soil. So that earlier research I just shared with you comes back to play here. The more biology we have in the soil, the more phytonutrients we have in the end products, whether it's a grain product, a vegetable or fruit or nut product, or our animal protein products. The second most critical factor in these animal protein products is the diversity of the pastures or rangeland they're eating from. The greater the plant species diversity, the more phytonutrients we are finding in the beef, in the pork, in the eggs, in the milk, okay? So then let what Dr. Van Vliet did was he said, well, let's take the TMR rations and break them down, okay? There were a tiny bit of phytonutrients in them. So he said, but I'm going to break them down and find where are the phytonutrients. So here you find that the vast majority of the phytonutrients, even in the TMRs, was in the hay that they ground to put into the TMR to add the roughage to the TMR. Not in the corn, not in the soybeans, not in the wheat mitts. Okay? It wasn't in the grain products in the TMR. The phytonutrients were in the ground hay that they're principally using as a roughage source. Then if we look at, again, some critically important antioxidants, uh, we find that in all cases here, out of these four antioxidants, that in the pasture-raised animals, they had significantly higher antioxidant content in the meat compared to the feedlot-raised animals on the TMR. If we look at the soils, we compared the soils where the grass-fed and pasture-raised animals were compared to the row crop fields where the TMR rations were produced. We find soil organic matter was far better in the pastures than the row crop fields. We found that exchange capacity, nutrient exchange capacity, was far better in the pasture versus the crops. And then we look if as we look at various elements or nutrients, again, far better in the pasture versus the the row crop fields. Now, here's the irony of this, is that none of these pastures were fertilized with anything other than the manure and urine dropping straight out of the rear end of the grazing animals, okay? Um, no fertilizer was purchased and applied in these pastured situations in this study. But what did they do in the row crop fields? They applied copious amounts of fertilizer, and yet, the pastures with no fertilizer applied beat the socks off of the row crop fields that purchased and applied a lot of fertilizer, okay? Now here, I also find this one ironic. Let's look at vitamin content. So the vitamin content in the pasture products was much higher than the TMR proteins, in spite of the fact that what do we do with every TMR ration? We put in a vitamin mineral prepack, right? They're added to the ration. So where are they in the end product? Why is that not showing up? If it's added to the TMR, where in the heck is it in the final product that we're consuming as a consumer? It's not there, guys. It's not there. This, this study shows it. This research proves that. 
but yet it is there in the pasture fed. Okay. Again, here's the irony of this. None of those animals on pasture were given a vitamin mineral prepack. Not a one of them. They weren't supplemented with that. Whereas the feedlot animals were. So again, a lot of irony here in this data. And then to finish up some key points here. So if you look at a handful in, in the beef, and this is comparing the, the pasture raised to the feedlot fed and finished. Key phytonutrients as we look down this list of phytonutrients across all of them, significantly higher in the pasture ra raised versus the feedlot finished. If we look at key vitamins, again, the same thing, significantly higher in the pastured versus the feedlot. And again, in fatty acids, significantly higher fatty acid content in looking at omega-3, CLAs, all of that versus the feedlot, and in the omega-6 to 3 ratio, we want this to be lower, significantly lower. We want a lot less omega-6s compared to omega-3s because high levels of omega-6 produces significant inflammation in our bodies and in, the and in the bodies of our livestock. So we saw a significantly lower omega-6 to 3 ratio, averaged 1.7 to 1, compared to anywhere from an 11 to 1 to over 50 to 1 in feedlot beef. So it was extremely variable in feedlot beef. And here's the key, the really high omega-6 to 3 ratios that got 40 to 1, 50 to 1, even 55 to 1 were in animals that were fed DDGs, dried distiller's grains. We have found this over and over again. When, when we feed our livestock, no matter the species, beef, dairy, pigs, chickens, whatever, when we feed them DDGs, guys, and this is absolutely rock solid data here, and we've done this over and over, DDGs produce a very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And that, that inflames those animals more and makes them more susceptible to disease and disorder. And it certainly inflames us and does the same thing to us. So I know DDGs have been highly touted. And when I was with the university, I encouraged people to use DDGs as a byproduct feed stuff. But guys, our data is showing something very different here. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you. And then in dairy, so I'll finish up with the dairy. We did this in dairy as well. And this was, to me, blew me out of the water. Okay, so what we did, we looked at all of these different phytonutrient categories that, you know, like flavones and total phenols and, and phytonutrients that have positive impacts on heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so on and so forth. And we looked at grazing dairies compared to TMR-based dairies, commodity dairies. And we did have one grazing dairy that just absolutely stood out above the others. This happened, it happens to be Derek Smith's in Cold Spring, Minnesota, and he's also a consultant with Understanding Ag. His dairy farm just blew everybody else's out of the water, but he's got a highly diverse, highly, highly diverse pastures. He's moving his dairy cows four to six times a day every day to new paddocks, all of this. So you'll see here the best grazer than the average grass-fed dairy, and those percentages are deviated from the commodity dairies. This is how much higher they were in these vital phytonutrients compared to the commodity dairy, okay? The, the, the dairies on the TMR rations. So look at this, 257% higher, 200% higher, 420, 600% higher, 172% higher. Which milk do you want to drink, guys? Yeah, this, this becomes a no-brainer to me. And then if we look at fatty acid profile, the same thing. You know, the significantly higher across the board and all of these fatty acids in the milk compared to the commodity dairy. And then when we look at the omega-6 to 3 ratio, way, way, way lower compared to commodity-produced milk. So 
the bottom line is, guys, beef is not beef. Eggs are not eggs. Milk is not milk. Grains are not grains. They vary dramatically in terms of the phytonutrient content and their health aspect. So that, that was a lot thrown at you in a very short period of time. I realize that. I'm going to stop here and open it up for Q&A. Uh, Everybody take a deep breath. That was a lot, Dr. Williams, but thank you. Um, I am grateful that this is being recorded and we've got access to this. I know that uh, that information is in other places as well, but... Um, I thought, you know, before, uh, when I was thinking about this presentation today, I thought it, it'd be awesome if we had two days to spend with you, because I know we've only scratched the surface. And I think in two days, we would never get bored of listening to you speak, because I've, I've been to the um, classes that you and Gabe uh, have taught. What, um, so we've got maybe some in the, some questions in the chat we'll go to, but um, yeah, just, let him know what you think. If a person wants to test their own products, mm -hmm. Alan, can they stack them up? If they send them to um, Utah State, can they stack them up against the baseline? Yes, absolutely. Uh, just do keep in mind that uh, Dr. Van Vliet's, Van Vliet's lab is <laughs> very backlogged hey. as a result of this data. Yeah, it's presented yeah. there. There are many, many now who want to have their products tested to see where where do they stack up, where do they stand. Uh, so yes, they can they can send samples in and have them tested, and uh, you know, and 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 you can compare. And it, and if anybody wants, if they have if they have this done, uh, feel free to contact me, and I'll go through your results with you. And help okay. you understand them and understand how they compare to the baseline. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, kind of rapid fire some questions Questions here. I'll read them and uh, just so it gets on the recording. Um, Jen asks, are these resources ready to share with friends and family or uh, potential customers? A absolutely. Uh, now, keep in mind that... You know, your your farm and your products may test differently, depends mm -hmm. on what you're doing and your soil biology. And so remember, the two keys, guys, are building your soil biology and building your plant species diversity. If you want to build in a really rich phytonutrient profile there, uh, but don't take the results I presented to you today and just automatically transfer them to your yeah. farm. They may or may not you know, apply to your farm, but, uh, but focus on those two keys and make no mistake about it. You will be building a more positive phytonutrient profile. Very good. Um, would you be willing to share these slides? Is there Absolutely. Send them to our, send them Absolutely. To our team? Mm -hmm. We can, okay, we'll do that. We'll send them out. Uh, in one of the thank you emails that we're sending out for those who've attended, we'll just, we'll just click them or, Somehow we'll get them disseminated, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, another another question here: What's what does it work like? What does it look like to work with understanding ag? And maybe that leads a little bit into the offer that you have on that page, cost and so forth. Yeah, so it, it's real simple. Just if if you want to inquire about our services with an understanding ag, just send us an email. Go to info at understandingag.com. And uh, we can send you, uh, you know, our, our what we call our fee agreement, and that details our cost. Okay, it's very straightforward. You know, we, and and there's never any hidden costs there. And here here's what we tell every client. Okay, number one is that we are real farmers and ranchers. You know, it's important to know that we're not theorists, we're not academicians, yeah. you know, or whatever. We we do this, so we never ever teach, advocate, and promote anything that we ourselves do not do. Number two, we never promote. We don't receive any commissions, brokerages, or anything. We never we never connect ourselves to a product or a technology and rep that, and that's so we can mm -hmm. remain completely unbiased. 
to give yeah. you the very best information. And number three, you should never have to hire us for life. We teach and mm -hmm. equip you. And if you need us as much five years from now as you need us today, you need to fire our butts because we haven't done our job. Okay. <laughs> so that, that's how we operate. Yeah, that's me. I love it. I love the model and um, that's great. Uh, we unfortunately don't have time for a lot of the questions. If you wanted to answer them in the chat, Alan, you could um, certainly reach out. He, Alan and his team are very responsive. I guess Kathy, does she still field a lot of the calls for you guys? Yep, yep. yep. Okay. And, yep. and happy to handle any questions. If if you want to email questions in, alan at understandingag.com, A-L-L-E-N, and I will be very, very happy to to be responsive to questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, and I don't want to open a whole can of worms, but um, can you cover this briefly? Just where I, I believe we're kind of at a transition point where we're seeing the fragility of our current system, um, food system, and there is an emerging alternative system um, can you just speak to very briefly um, what our role as an average farmer and rancher is in helping this system to grow legs and to be there to what I believe at some point replace the archaic system that never really did work? Yeah, absolutely. And and for me, it all goes back to that principle of stewardship. Yeah, you know, we we first have to realize we have not really been good stewards. And I had to realize that myself and admit it to myself. You know, I for many, many years I thought I was being a great steward and discovered, wow, I'm I'm really failing in this. And I was failing because the honest truth is, Jared, I didn't understand it. Okay. So that's why we developed the six three four to help people far better understand this is principles driven, not practices driven. Right. Yeah. And uh, and and the second thing to realize is that there is far, far more abundance still here that we can tap into than than we ever conceived. And that if we focus first on that soil and building soil health and soil biology and diversity, those are the two keys. If we focus first on that, then everything else, you know, sort of results from that. So that's our foundation. And that's that's what we're really really looking for me lo looking for, and uh, and what I would tell anybody is that you know if you're getting started or, or you're wanting to learn about this and you've never been to a soil health academy, that's a great great way to get a real hands on practical introduction. Our three day schools that are always on a host farm or ranch that is doing this, and you can sort of immerse yourself in this for three days to learn how to do this contextually on your own farm or ranch. Hey, very good. Very, very good. Um, Alan, thank you very much. Please in the chat, send him some gratitude, appreciation, emojis, hand claps, hair claps. Um, this way to just absolutely knock it out of the park. Um, this presentation was exactly what helps to tie a lot of these pieces together that we're trying to get together, having a having a business, starting with the soil, um, integrating livestock, all the components that a lot of us are trying to do and uh, not always as successfully as we would like to. And so thank you for bringing it all together, Alan. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, God bless you and yours, and thanks for the work that you do. Keep it up. Thanks.